its earliest days, computer design has been inspired by the biology of living organisms, especially the brain. And today, with our rapidly expanding knowledge of how the brain works, the potential of neuromorphic computing has never been more evident. As a director of Intel's Neuromorphic Computing Lab, Mike Davies works with a diverse team of experts to understand the principles of brain computation at the cellular level, seeking practical ways to replicate the remarkable architecture and capabilities of the brain in a form that can be implemented and mass-produced in the digital world. Mike's leadership in this specialized field and his standing as a senior principal engineer in Intel Labs puts him in a unique position to share the latest insights from the promising future of neuromorphic computing. This is Architecture All Access. In neuromorphic computing, we look to biology to uncover the secrets that nature has evolved over a billion years, supporting the incredible efficiency, speed, and intelligence found in the brains of organisms. In fact, this is nothing new. Brains have been inspiring computing for decades, starting with the greats of modern computing, von Neumann, Alan Turing. Those pioneers had the brain in mind when they were developing the original architectural notions of computing that have flourished over the decades since and have changed the world. Consider the capabilities of a tiny cockatiel parrot brain, a two gram brain running on about 50 milliwatts of power. This brain enables the cockatiel to fly at speeds up to 20 miles an hour, to navigate unknown environments while foraging for food, and even to learn to manipulate objects as tools and utter human words. On these tasks, the cockatiel's brain far outperforms today's state-of-the-art computer architectures in all dimensions, speed, weight, power, by orders of magnitude. The vision of my field is to understand the principles of brain computation at the circuit level and then map this insight into a form that we can implement and mass produce in chips for breakthroughs in technology. Now, to understand neuromorphic computing, you first need to know a few things about biological neural networks. All of the information processing in brains occurs in networks of neurons and similar neuron-like cells. Neurons communicate using voltage pulses or spikes that they generate at critical times. Spikes travel along a neuron's axon or its output channel, which repeatedly split like branches of a tree until they reach connections to other neurons called synapses. At each synapse, an incoming spike injects a brief flow of ions into the attached compartment or dendrite of the destination neuron. This causes the voltage across the dendrite surface membrane to change over time. You can think of this as charging or discharging energy. All of the neuron's dendritic voltage changes aggregate at the center of the neuron, or soma. Typically, there's a fight between excitatory inputs, which tend to activate the neuron, and inhibitory inputs, which deactivate it. If the excitation becomes strong enough, the soma fires and generates an output spike. In biology, spikes have no magnitude. They are binary events, with their information being encoded by the particular times that they fire. At the network level, there are billions of these neurons, and what's striking is the number of connections. Each neuron typically connects to 10,000 other neurons. That degree of circuit complexity and connectedness is well beyond what we'd have in a standard CMOS chip that we might traditionally build. These patterns of connectivity are far from the deeply layered feed-forward neural networks that dominate AI today. They are recurrent and irregular networks with loops everywhere. As spikes flow through the network, the neurons are continually storing and releasing energy as they interact, like springs compressing or oscillating. The computation we experience in brains is the emergent result of these interactions, like the ripples in a pond that result from the interaction between billions of water molecules. Let's look at a simplified example that shows the intuition of how spiking neural networks can achieve great energy efficiency and low latency, despite using neurons that operate on slow biological timescales. Well, consider a visual object recognition problem, namely recognizing an image of a cat. Similar to the brain, the neuromorphic network will process the image using 10,000 neurons that operate in parallel, but on a millisecond timescale. 
Now, conventionally, we would take a snapshot of the visual scene, just like we've been doing for 150 years. And this would produce an array of numbers that encode each pixel value. This becomes a featureless stream of data that has to be processed together in a serialized or vectorized way. But the brain doesn't process visual information like that. Directly at the retina, spikes are produced, which encode features, not raw pixels. These features might represent changes in texture, motion, and color. The timing of these spikes represents the prominence of each feature. So this gives a spatiotemporal spike pattern or signature that encodes the visual information. It's the timing relationships between these spikes, which is what's important. So now this signature, this spike pattern, can be distributed to all of the 10,000 neurons quite slowly, needing to preserve only the temporal relationships. Each neuron has previously learned a particular temporal signature, and based on the degree of match between the input spikes it sees and its stored signature, it may produce an output spike. The better the match, the faster the neuron will spike. As these neurons are starting to match and produce spikes indicating the presence of their features, there's also what's called an inhibitory network of neurons. These are feedback neurons that sense activity in the network and broadcast back a stop message to the 10,000 neurons once enough output spikes are generated. This effectively power gates the activity at a very fine level of granularity. Within the time needed to turn off computation, a few of the feature neurons will have generated some output spikes. And of course, those output spikes will be temporarily encoded, just like the input spikes, representing the inference result that the cat was spotted, and maybe the particular type of cat. Compare that to how a conventional deep learning solution would operate on a conventional architecture. The input image, represented as a large array of numbers, would be repeatedly multiplied by a large catalog of matrices encoding the stored features. This expands into a huge number of multiply accumulation operations executed at gigahertz speeds. All of these matrices need to be repeatedly streamed from a memory into the computing resources. While the operations can be computed at great speeds, the memory interface becomes a sequential bottleneck. There is a limit to how fast and how wide this memory interface can be pushed before introducing other complexities, such as the need for input batching. Ultimately, the conventional architecture may produce its result with the same delay as the neuromorphic network, thanks to its throughput advantage, but that comes at an enormous cost in raw operations and energy. And the memory bottleneck means that the solution won't scale like the brain does. Now, the lesson that emerges from this is that sparse asynchronous communication is efficient and can be fast despite using slow computing elements. So this motivates a different perspective on AI and computation in general. If we can build an architecture that processes information encoded in sparse events, inherently sensitive to change and temporal correlations, then we can open the door to new possibilities for achieving energy efficiency and speed. This is a new type of computing. Sensors might directly generate spikes, saving output bandwidth. And as the spikes arrive at a neuromorphic chip for processing, they will activate only the neuron pathways that are affected by the sensor's data changes. This leads to reductions in energy and latency, important for applications like robotics, where there's a need for immediate response to the unpredictable change of the real world. As we create recurrent connections in these networks and allow weights and other parameters to evolve over time, we now have a nonlinear event-driven dynamical system. Mathematically, this is an extremely powerful construct. Computation in such a system is an emergent process. It's the consequence of millions of neurons independently executing and interacting. Input data disrupts the network and causes it to settle into some new equilibrium state, encoding a computational result. From an AI perspective, learning too is emergent. As the network processes information, it self-organizes, reconfiguring its parameters until it achieves a better adapted state for solving whatever objective it's tackling. This is how brains in nature operate, and it's the computational paradigm that we are pursuing in neuromorphic computing. Rather than execute rigidly programmed instructions as in conventional processors, neuromorphic chips search for equilibrium states in their program networks. 
Rather than stream matrices through memories and arithmetic units, neuromorphic chips propagate spikes through sparse recurrent networks. So how do we map these neuromorphic computing concepts into chips we can actually build? I will cover that and more in part two. I hope you'll join me.